G'day everyone and welcome to a video update um, from the Legal Studies Guy. Um, so today we're going to be updating uh, 3.1.7 which is around plea negotiations and sentence indications. Um, this is particularly because uh, just recently in the last month there's been a quite significant legislative change around how the sentence indication scheme works. Um, so this video will update that. We're going to run through plea negotiations as well in the same video, um, but unlike with previous updates, we will leave the old video up, um, just because it's likely that we'll probably push through this one a little bit quicker, focus on sentence indications. So if you do want a bit more of a, I guess, an in-depth look at plea negotiations and, and some of the skills around that, um, the other video will be there as well. Um, but yeah, we'll crack into, into this update and the changes now. Um, same quote, if you do watch the other video, you can skip um, through, but really enjoy this one. Success is where preparation and opportunity meet from Bobby Hunter. So again, um, you know, there's a lot of things that go into success, but it's certainly not luck. Um, it's certainly not something that just, oh, geez, that happened to me. I don't, I don't know what else, you know, I didn't do anything to, to help me get there. Um, success is very much when you've got the opportunity, which you do this year in year 12, is coupled with that preparation. So putting that work in, which you're obviously doing by watching this, um, plus the opportunity you've got in front of you, is going to lead to success. It's not just going to happen by itself. So, as I said in the really quick intro, we are focused on plea negotiations and sentence indications and their role in determining a criminal matter. Um, so what sort of purpose they play um, in in both instances, trying to get an accused person to plead guilty so that the criminal matter, the criminal case is resolved. Um, it all comes back to this really important skill here. So discuss and justify the appropriateness of the means used to resolve or determine a criminal case. Again, focusing on these two methods that enable us to try and get an early guilty plea, um, plea negotiations and sentence indications. I'll talk a bit more when we get to the skill. The, obviously, the other means to determine a criminal case is just to have a trial. Um, we're not going to go into a lot of depth there because so many of the other dot points cover that, um, but that's certainly something to consider as we talk about these as well. So, look, our essential question, what we're going to answer today is, what are plea negotiations? I mean, what are sentence indications? So actually, what are they? Um, what, yeah, how do they work? What is their mechanism? And when are they appropriate? When do we want to use them versus when do we not? So, as we know, it comes up quite often. It's one of the factors that really impact the criminal justice system is time. Criminal trials are really, really lengthy, um, particularly with COVID. And this is where the sentence indication changes come from. Um, the delays can be massive and, you know, it was definitely before COVID looking at like minimum 18 months in the county court um, from committal to your trial. So that's not even including the time up to committal. Um, it's extended out a lot. I don't have any updated stats um, since COVID. But if you're already looking at a year and a half and then we've had these COVID delays, you've got to imagine that the time from your charge right through until when you actually get your case heard in court is long. Um, there's issues with that. There's issues around witnesses and their reliability. There's issues around the stress it puts on an accused person. At that point, they have to be presumed to be innocent. Um, the stress put on the victim and, and other witnesses involved. Realistically, the quicker we can resolve criminal matters, the better. So what the prosecution has at their disposal is some tools to try and convince the accused person to plead guilty. So that's what we're really going to focus on here is how can the prosecution convince an accused person to plead guilty because that's what they're trying to do. And the two major tools that we cover in the study design are plea negotiations and sentence indications. So tools to promote a guilty plea is really our focus here. So plea negotiations. Um, as I said, another video on this that you can go and look at if you'd like, but we will just cover them really, really quickly. It's basically where you, the prosecution says to an accused person, hey, I want you, or we want you to plead guilty, we want you to say that you did this, we're going to offer you an incentive to do that. We're going to offer you a 
uh, reduced charge. So basically saying, hey, we're gonna take your charge down from one of the most common examples from murder. We're gonna get rid of the murder charge. We're gonna turn it into manslaughter. And if we turn it into manslaughter, you plead guilty in response. Um, why that's an incentive for an accused person is a lesser charge, a less serious offence, naturally comes with a lesser sanction. So, um, you know, a murder um, prison sentence is, you know, maximum's life, obviously, but is upwards of 15, 20 plus years, whereas a manslaughter sentence might be closer to 10. Um, so there's a real incentive for a person to take that lesser charge. The other option is often when people are charged with offences, you'll see this in news reports, you know, someone's been charged with 204 offences, um, or they've been charged with 113 offences. There's, there's a range of different crimes they've committed, um, often over a number of years, particularly if it's some kind of, you know, fraud, financial sort of crime, um, that means they're charged with lots and lots of different offences for different things that they've done. What the prosecution can offer an accused person is saying, hey, we'll get rid of, say, 50 of these and roll them back to sort of only 60 charges, um, might be an example. And in, I suppose, um, as a thanks for us doing that, you just plead guilty and you resolve the dispute and we don't have to go to a trial. So again, giving the accused person some kind of positive reason for why they should plead guilty and skip a trial and end proceedings. Now, it's very, very important to note that these are the two incentives, not a reduced sentence. Obviously, a reduced charge leads to a reduced sentence, but the prosecution does not offer a reduced sentence. This is not an American crime show. This is not an American um, law drama like Law and Order, where they say, hey, you're looking at you know 15 years in prison. We can guarantee you only 10 if you plead guilty. The judge is responsible for sentencing, not the prosecution. So the, the prosecution cannot offer a sentence reduction. They can only offer a charge reduction or the removal of some charges. And in return, hopefully, we're gonna get a guilty plea. Sentence indications. Now this is a, um, this is the scheme or the, the um, the program that has changed with a legislative change last month. So previously, and I'll just say this quickly in case you've got an old textbook or you've watched the old video, previously you could ask the judge whether you would be sent to prison or not. That was it. So a judge would look at the facts of the case and go, hey, if you plead guilty now, I will send you to prison or I won't. And the idea being that if you hear that you won't be sent to prison, so you'll get a community-based sanction, you know, likely a community corrections order if it's some kind of borderline offence. You are more likely to plead guilty knowing that, hey, I'm not going to go to jail, I'm just going to cop my community corrections order, do the things that I have to do as part of that, and avoid prison. So it promotes the guilty plea. What the change is, how this has changed is, at any point now after the charge sheet is filed right up until trial you can ask the judge as an accused person both what type of sentence you'll receive and the duration of that sentence so you're actually asking the judge hey if i plead guilty right now will you send me to jail and if you do how long will you send me to jail for so you're getting a lot more information than you were under the previous scheme. So as I said, this was updated in the uh, Justice Legislation Amendment 2021, got royal sent early Feb 2022, um, so really fresh. So it's actually a recent reform as well, which we'll cover in our updated reforms video. Um, a few things with this. So why it's meant to, um, again, incentivize a guilty plea is some people might want to run the risk of going to trial if they think, okay, like, I'm going to go to prison anyway. Why don't I just take it to trial and see what happens? Maybe a witness will pull out because of the stress and trauma. Um, maybe something will go my way. Maybe a witness will be viewed as unreliable. Maybe I'll get a um, friendly jury and I might actually get away with it. I'm going to go to jail, so I may as well just risk it and go to trial. The idea being by extending the scheme, if you know exactly how long you're going to jail for, because the indication that you're given by the judge is a cap 
the sentence that you subsequently get if you plead guilty. So you have to plead guilty at the earliest possible chance. So, you know, ideally you'd get your indication you're going to talk to your lawyer and plead guilty that day or within days. The sentence that you will then get after you plead guilty is not able to be higher than the indication given. And that's a really important point. So whatever indication you're given, your sentence can only go down from there, not up. So if you're if you've committed some kind of you know borderline offence you know like an offence sorry not a borderline offence an offence you know you're going to prison for and you get an indication and you're like oh shit maximum sentence is ten years you know I'm probably going to get found guilty I don't know and you get an indication and the judge says I, I'd send you to prison for a year and a half eighteen months you might go you know what I can cop that. I don't want to run the risk of going through a trial and then, you know, without the uh, the reduction that you get from a guilty plea, um, some of the things that come with that, like a remorse, um, I don't want to run the risk of going to trial, being found guilty, and then getting three years or two, year, two and a half years instead of a year and a half. I may as well take, I may as well plead guilty now and take the year and a half. So you can see how the information from a sentence indication can really... Um, incentivize a guilty plea from an accused person. Um, the thing is, what's changed here, um, when you apply for a sentence indication, you have to, uh, the prosecution can oppose it. Um, previously, the prosecution had to approve it. So if they said, no, you didn't get an indication, um, now the prosecution can just oppose a sentence indication. And we'll talk more about why the prosecution might oppose a sentence indication might say, no, I don't want them to get an indication of their sentence when we talk about its appropriateness. Um, ultimately, if we go right back through, we'll see that the key knowledge here is the purposes of sentence indications and plea negotiations. And the purpose is really simple. It's about promoting a guilty plea. It's all about incentivizing that guilty plea to resolve the dispute early. The benefit of resolving the dispute early is you remove backlog from the court system, which we have a massive backlog due to COVID and the fact they couldn't hold jury trials. The more guilty pleas you get, the less trials you have to run, the quicker you get through the cases you have, um, the less time people are left waiting for justice, both victims and accused persons and society as a whole. So promoting a guilty plea is the purpose. So the big thing here, discuss and justify the appropriateness. So when should we use them? When should we use plea negotiations? When should we use sentence indications? But also with a discussion, remember, a discussion is always an exchange of opinions. So not only when should we use plea negotiations and sentence indications, but when should we not use them is really important. So this is the sort of question you might get. Discuss the appropriateness of using plea negotiations to resolve a criminal dispute um, with no material or no, um, yeah, no case study, no stimulus. You could also get a stimulus material and then get asked to discuss the discuss the appropriateness of plea negotiations in this instance. So you're expected to pull things out of the case to say why they would be appropriate and why they wouldn't. Um, so let's look at when they are appropriate and when they're not. So again, plea negotiations being the reduction of charges. Okay, So reducing the charges to get a guilty plea. It's important to think about victims when we talk about this. So Let's think about a victim. You've been the victim of a crime, you hear that a person has been charged. Say you're a family member of someone who's been murdered, or, or you believe has been murdered. Um, you want the person who has, in your mind, in the police's mind, who's charged them, you want that person to be tried and found guilty of murder. You want them to uh, face court for a, crime, a charge that fits the crime, fits the act that they've done. How do you feel as a family member if the police or the prosecution, sorry, come to you and say, we've actually decided that, you know, they're going to plead guilty and we're just going to change it to manslaughter. They're going to reduce it. Manslaughter, you know, there's no intent there. How do you feel as a victim if, uh, as a family member of someone who's been killed, if that happens? Probably not very happy. Similarly for things like, 
um, say you're you're a living victim of say a sexual assault crime um, you know reduction in charges there um, can lead to you know significantly reduced sentences and increase the trauma that a victim faces as well when they feel like the accused person didn't actually uh, get sentenced and face the appropriate um, punishment for the crime that they actually the act that they actually committed. So if a victim doesn't wish for lesser charges to be considered, the prosecution should probably consider that and should probably not enter into plea negotiations. They should be like, hey, the victim doesn't want me to reduce charges, I should consider their wishes. Now, the prosecution ha doesn't have to do that, but they probably should to ensure that the victim has access to justice. Um, the other big one is high-profile cases. The public, there's been big articles on this, often run by the Herald Sun, the public hates the idea of criminals getting away with it. Criminals getting lesser charges um, to plead guilty. The idea of, you know, um, these... Uh, uh, the unwashed criminal class just getting away with um, getting away with their crimes and getting out of jail really quickly when they should have been facing more serious charges. Now, how true some of those public sentiments are is um, is questionable. Um, the public tends to love long jail sentences when we know from um, research, etc., that long jail sentences tend to increase criminality in people. Um, but the reality is, in a high-profile case. The lack of transparency around a plea negotiation reducing someone's charge really makes generally society unhappy and society feels like justice hasn't been done. So plea negotiations might be not appropriate when you're considering the interests of the general public who are stakeholders in the criminal justice system. When do we want to use plea negotiations though? Uh, if you're worried as the prosecution, if you're worried about the availability of a witness or the reliability of a witness, you know that that might lead to no conviction. If that witness gets up in court and isn't convincing, um, if that witness pulls out, you have no case anymore. So you might enter plea negotiations knowing that, hey, running this to trial, even though we, we, we think the person has done this, even though we're confident that we have the evidence, running this to trial might lead to no conviction, we should push for a negotiation to get a conviction. Guarantee a conviction because that's better for society. It's the same as if there's any issues with admissibility of key evidence. Again, let's push for um, a guilty plea so that we can ensure the conviction. And also the other one is sometimes police just get the charge wrong. They charge someone with a higher crime, hand it over to the prosecutors. Prosecutors look at it and go, mm, getting a murder one across the line is probably going to be tough maybe we just offer manslaughter and move on. Um, so that can happen as well. Ultimately, uh, they're very much appropriate when we're trying to speed things up and, and clear backlog in the court system. Sentence indications. Uh, when are they appropriate and when they're not appropriate? Going straight to not appropriate again, thinking about similar with plea negotiations. It's about thinking about the wishes of victims. Um, a sentence indication by a judge so the judge is going to look at the facts of the case in terms of what's going to go to trial and the judge is going to go okay if you plead guilty now this is the sentence I'll give you what you would have hopefully already covered or will cover in I think 319 is the sentencing process and particularly things like victim impact statements so when the judge is sentencing someone through the full sentencing process. The amount of information that they have um, in the victim impact statement about how the crime has affected the person um, who is the victim, you know, families of the people physically harmed, um, that can really alter what sanction and what sentence a judge would give. And ultimately, in a sentence indication, the judge doesn't have access to that information. So there's the chance that a victim is going to oppose through the prosecution which we've got here would oppose a sentence indication and say hey it's not appropriate because the judge isn't going to properly properly know what impact this crime had on me and therefore their indication can't actually be close to what it should be so think about particularly say something like family violence um you know on the face of the facts of the matter yes it's violence against a family member. Um, yes, there's a really increased scrutiny on that in society. But it could look on paper, on face value, like ultimately some kind of assault. 
and the judge might give a sentence indication that doesn't actually match up with the amount of trauma, the amount of ongoing impact that's caused to the victim. And we know that, as we said earlier, the indication given by a judge is effectively a cap on the sentence. So the judge can't then see a victim impact statement and add time because of the way the scheme operates. So there are certain crimes and certain situations where a sentence indication wouldn't be appropriate and the prosecution should seek to oppose it. Um, when are they appropriate? <clears throat> um, this was still taken from the, the last... Um, that should be a tick. This was still taken from the last one, but it, it's really appropriate in borderline cases. If a person, like, they're finding out the duration of the sentence, but they're also finding out what sentence they're, or what sanction they're going to be given. If they find out they're not going to prison, that's going to promote a guilty plea. So sentence indications are really, really appropriate in borderline cases where a person's not sure whether they'll be imprisoned because finding out that they're not going to be imprisoned is going to lead to a guilty plea. Um, they're much more appropriate more broadly now because you know you're going to find out a range of or a cap on your actual time in jail um also really really appropriate in victimless crimes if you don't have to worry about the views of the victim and the victim impact statement um so particularly say some drug offenses financial crimes like fraud where the money hasn't actually necessarily come from individuals um sentence indication is much more appropriate because the sentencing process is a little more straightforward um, so that's when sentence indications would be more likely to be used and they might be opposed by the prosecution in some of these crimes that really have um, uh, human victims um, particularly sexual offenses family violence offenses uh, as always we need to come back to this idea of how good is the criminal justice system at achieving fairness equality and access um, so, as always, have a think about sentence indications and plea negotiations. I should have just said as well, sorry, the other one you want to talk about is appropriateness of trial, because sometimes you just want to send someone to trial. When's a trial appropriate when it's not? Um, that's covered in particularly thinking about the roles and responsibilities of key personnel um, in that video, and also the court hierarchy where it talks through particularly how having a trial can really promote fairness um, in terms of processes, procedures followed, um, access, etc, etc. So one to consider as well. Uh, in terms of plea negotiations and sentence indications and our principles of justice, um, fairness, because if we can get a guilty plea, even if conviction's unlikely, that's good for society, that's fair for society that someone is going to go um, or someone is going to face some kind of sanction for the wrong that they committed to society. However, um, particularly of concern, and this will come out the whole way down, is if an accused person is unrepresented, um, they don't have a lawyer, they might be pressured into pleading guilty in plea negotiations, they might not have all the possible information against them, um, they may not fully understand what's happening, so some access issues there. So really, really important to consider what happens if an accused person's unrepresented and how that can impact the principles of justice. Uh, as we said, the purpose is promoting a guilty plea, so really, really, really big around um, access. It's about improving efficiency um, and trying to get through cases quicker. That can actually be easier for victims as well because they don't have to go through a trial process, which increases their access. Um, and victims have to be consulted around a sentence indication, which means they're involved in the process. Uh, the sentence indication scheme is available for all accused persons. Um, this is particularly enhanced now that you can ask about how long you're going to go to prison for, because really you couldn't get a sentence indication if you were facing a crime that definitely led to jail. Um, the, ac the scheme is much more accessible for all um, accused persons now. Um, but then thinking about here, as we discussed, the lack of formality, not including victim impact statements, not going through you know, submissions from the prosecution and the defence around similar cases and the sentences that were given to try and, you know, show the judge what they should be considering means you might be lacking some equality in sentencing um, and the lack of access for the victim as a result um, could be contrary to the principles of justice. So just things to think about. 
A uh, few extra resources, as I said, Herald Sun, um, big article on plea negotiations I did a while ago. Um, you'll see here that their um, headlines are a little bit inflammatory. Killers jail time slashed with plea deals that leave victims betrayed. So the whole idea that sometimes society can feel like plea negotiations aren't in their best interests. You know, victims are betrayed by plea negotiations. Um, and the other one is the sen sen Sentencing Advisory Council's info and sentence indications, which is always worth a good read. Um, ultimately, hopefully, by going through that, you are better placed to know what plea negotiations and sentence indications are, particularly with the changes to sentence indications, um, but also that really deep understanding of, hey, when would we use them? When should the prosecution be looking to enter plea negotiations with an accused person? When should an accused person be asking for a sentence indication? Um, and should the prosecution oppose that? And, and should and, and the involvement of victims in that? Um, as always, comments below, shoot us messages um, if you've got any follow-up questions. Um, but hopefully that covers the changes in full detail. Um, and yeah, thank you for tuning in to another video from the Legal Studies Guy.